Welcome to Lesson 7, Radioactivity and Geology. Let's recap a little of what we talked about the other times about radioactivity. So radioactivity is when an unstable radioactive atom decays. And there are three ways, three types of emissions that can happen based on this radioactive decay. So there's alpha decay, and that's where an alpha particle is emitted. An alpha particle being two protons and two neutrons. And if you remember from Rutherford's studies, that's a helium nucleus, because if you add electrons to this nucleus of two protons and two neutrons, you get helium, the element. The other, another type of decay is beta decay, and that's simply an electron being emitted. And then there's gamma decay, or gamma rays. Gamma rays are emitted as a, it's, it's a high energy electromagnetic emission, even more energy than x-rays. Now, if you'll remember, elements are defined by the number of protons they have. Another important measure of an element is the number of neutrons. And if you look on a periodic table, it tells you the number of neutrons as well. The number of neutrons dictates the isotope of the element. All that an isotope is, is an element with a different number of neutrons, and you specify that number. Let's take a look at a real example here on the periodic table of elements. A common element we probably all know is lead, and that's got the symbol Pb. You find it with the atomic number 82, that's the number at the top, and that means that there are 82 protons in lead. If it was an element with 83 protons, it would actually be called bismuth. So every element has a different number of protons. Each proton weighs one mass unit, and the total mass of a lead atom is 207 atomic mass units. So the only other thing in lead atoms that has a significant mass is the number of neutrons. And so because protons and neutrons weigh roughly the same amount, we round them off to one mass unit each, we know that 207 being the total mass of a lead atom, minus 82 proton caused mass units, means that there are 125 neutrons in a lead atom. So that's great. But what's really interesting here is that that 207 number that magically appears on this table didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, that's just an average of what different lead atoms that have been weighed on Earth actually come out to if you average them by their weight and how many times you find that they occur. And so all of these different weights of lead atoms are caused by atoms with 82 protons, so they're definitely lead, but they have different numbers of neutrons, and it might end up being a mass of 206 or 207, and we call those lead atoms with different numbers of neutrons different lead isotopes. And you can learn a wealth of information from isotopes, and specifically lead isotopes, as we'll see.
As we've discussed, uranium is a radioactive element. It's unstable and it sheds energy and mass in the form of radioactive decay, all three, alpha, beta, and gamma decay, in a series of transformations and decay products until finally it transmutes itself into a stable isotope of an element. So how is this important to us in geology? Well, it has to do with time and the time it takes for radioactive elements to decay is very predictable. It's always the same. It's known as the half-life. And what that refers to is the time it takes for half of the number of atoms of a certain given sample of an element to decay to a stable daughter product. For uranium, the time it takes for half of it to decay to lead is about 4.47 billion years. And it turns out that's actually a really convenient half-life for studying Earth processes. They're sort of on the same scale. So how do we apply this to Earth science? Well, it turns out that some crystals, some mineral crystals, actually accept uranium into their structure, but don't allow lead into the structure. And the way they do this, an example is zircon. And it forms a lattice, and in that lattice it can substitute in uranium as a defect or replacement. That uranium starts out undecayed, and once the crystal's formed, it decays into lead. We know how long it takes for uranium to decay to lead. And since there was no lead in the crystal to start with, we can know very accurately how long this uranium has been decaying, and therefore how long it has been since the crystal was created. So that's amazing. Rutherford actually suggested that this would be possible around 1905, and it was a fellow named Bertram Boltwood, a radiochemist, I think 1907, who started actually applying this and dating rocks. He got as far as 2.2 billion years. That was the oldest rocks that he could find. And that is old. And it shattered any previous proof of how old the Earth was. But people didn't really believe him. They wanted to, I suppose. But they, radioactivity was still new. It was sort of this hand-wavy pseudoscience at that point in people's minds. The proof was in fact there. But it wasn't until about the 50s that the technique was perfected and acceptance started to come about among, among the scholarly types. And you can see what would happen. It was all of a sudden a race to find the oldest rocks on Earth. It turns out that the oldest rocks on Earth are only in the sort of centers of some very old continents. And in Canada, we have some of the very oldest rocks. In northern Quebec, there's the famous Acasta gneiss. Gneiss is a banded metamorphic rock. Zircons in the Acasta gneiss were dated to 4.36 billion years. So that's about the oldest that we've found. In the Jack Hills of Western Australia, they've also dated uh, some zircons to be older, some outliers have been up to 4.4 billion years, but really about the same as the Acasta gneiss. So that seems to be about the limit. But in fact, the oldest rocks ever dated so far in history that we know of are actually not from Earth at all. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture.